Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our workshop on 30 years of the internet in China. My name is Yang Guobin. I direct the uh, Center on Digital Culture and Society at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Today's workshop is part of a series of events organized to mark the 30th anniversary of China's connection to the internet. Before today's event, we held an in-person workshop which convened scholars who are mostly on the U.S. East Coast closer to Philadelphia. And tomorrow morning, we'll have another session at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, which is 9 p.m. Beijing time. There will also be a roundtable at the annual meeting of the International Communication Association in June this year. This series of events is the collective endeavor of several institutions, including our own center, as well as the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania, the College of Media and International Culture at Zhejiang University, and the Department of Media and Communication at City University of Hong Kong. We are honored to have the support of the SAGE Journal, Communication and the Public, which is edited by Professor Hong Yu at Zhejiang University and Professor Christine Huang at City University of Hong Kong. I want to thank all these collaborators for undertaking this project. I would also like to thank the organizing team at the University of Pennsylvania. They are Dr. Jing Yi Gu, a postdoctoral fellow at our Center on Digital Culture and Society, Dr. Jun Yi Lu, who is a post postdoctoral fellow at our Center for the Study of Contemporary China, and Ms. Chen, Chen Dan, who is administrative coordinator at our CDCS. Chen has especially has worked very hard behind the scene to make all the logistical and technical arrangements. Today we'll have six speakers. Uh, one of our speakers, uh, Professor Hai Qing Yu, unfortunately cannot attend because uh, she is ill. Uh, so we'll have six speakers today who will speak in the order listed on the program. I'll introduce them briefly, but uh, please, uh, very briefly, really, please Google their names to learn more about their work. If you don't know them already, I'm sure you know their uh, work already uh, since they're very accomplished. After our speakers finish their presentations, we'll take questions from the audience. So in the order of presentation, uh, the first one is uh, Matt the Butts, uh, who is a PhD student at Stanford University, and Professor Jennifer Pan, who is Sir Robert Ho Tong Professor of Chinese Studies and Professor of Communication and Political Science at Stanford University. The title of their talk is China's Internet Controls. What if citizens disengage? Next, we'll have Professor Jack Chiu, who is Shaw Foundation Professor of Media Technology, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, who will speak on the three constants of Chinese internet research. Professor Yunya Song is Professor and Director of AI and Media Research Lab, School of Communication, Hong Kong Baptist University, who will speak on gender, um, on gender and internet in China, a historical perspective. Uh, Professor Song also has two collaborators who I, who she will introduce uh, uh, herself. And next we have uh, Dr. Wang Wei, who is uh, at uh, starting, going to start a job very soon as the Henry Talents Program Research Fellow at the College of Media and International Culture, Zhejiang University who will speak on the reinvention of locality, reimagining local society with local media. Uh, Dr. Xu Jian, Senior Lecturer in Communication in the School of Communication and Creative Arts, D 
Deakin University, Australia, will speak on the topic from Wang Hong to Wang Hong thinking, new research agenda and critical reflections. Last but not least, Professor Wei Yu Zhang, who is professor in the Department of Communication New Media of National University of Singapore. And she will speak on 30 years of China's online fandom. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Matt Dabatz and uh, Professor Jennifer Pan. Right. Do we try to turn on our videos here? Please, yeah. Can you also uh, share your screen if, if you do have a screen, uh, a PPT to share? Uh, it says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it, but I can talk if you'd like. Oh, we have to uh, put you on video. Let's see. Uh, Chen, uh, can you do this? Yes, I can work on Gobin, would you like us to begin while she does that, or would you like us to wait? We can, we can just wait, wait a couple of seconds. should be fast. Okay. Could you share your screen to see if it works? Yes, although I wasn't planning to share the screen for very much of it, but yeah. But they, they OK. And can you, are you on the on video now? Mm -hmm. Still can't do that. Uh, let me see whether we have, I remember there is some function we need to click. So thank you so much. We're actually, I'm going to not only share my screen for a portion of it. Um, the rest of it, you'll get to see my uh, beautiful face as I talk. And the topic of our, our, our topic today is China's internet controls. And we're asking the question of what if citizens disengage? This is a project or a, a contribution from myself and Professor Jennifer Pan in the department. I'll be presenting on behalf of the both of us. So when the internet began in China 30 years ago, there was this consensus, we argue, that the internet would change China. And scholarship on this really segmented into sort of two avenues of how that change should be analyzed. The first was along this liberation repression Access And the idea was that the internet was this um, democratic force. It allowed for anonymity of speech. It was decentralized. It was interconnected. And as a result, it would present a challenge to authoritarian rule in China. The other, so, so a lot of the research in the, in, in along this axis, we're exploring whether the internet was doing that, whether it was presenting a challenge, and if so, what that challenge looked like. And especially in the early 90s and into the late 90s, as literature on democratization in the, in the wake of the uh, fall of the Soviet countries, there was this sort of latent assumption that the internet would or could lead to a similar result in China. Now, as China didn't follow those countries into democratization. There was a sort of shift along this axis as people started to think about the internet as an opportunity for authoritarian rule. And this started to look at questions about how the Chinese government could use the internet to influence the public at scale, to access public opinion, to enhance the governance rather than transforming their governance into a kind of Western model. So a lot of the literature in the early days was along this axis. So is it liberating or is it repressing? A second avenue of research, we argue, is one that's grounded in individual and group experience, not so much along an axis, and in fact was quite critical of that axis. It argued that this axis of liberation and repression actually obscured many of the important ways that citizens were using the internet in China, and it emphasized the diversity of internet activity and the ways that the internet empowered citizens on the internet. But both of these avenues shared a consensus that the internet was changing China. 
And over the last 30 years, we learned a lot about how that change had occurred. What I think many of us did not quite anticipate at the time was how China was also going to change the internet. So over the last 30 years, we argue that China has actually transformed what we think of the internet to be, and also what we think takes place on the internet. Specifically, the Chinese government's activity and use of the internet has caused us to reconceptualize what propaganda and censorship actually can look like. We are learning that it can be much more decentralized than we thought prior to the internet's entry into China. We are learning that the Chinese government is competing for attention in ways that we may not have anticipated, that there's a coalition of public and private actors that are carrying out these propaganda and censorship efforts. And we're using all of this to understand what government intentions might be when they regulate the internet. This basket is really a fundamental re-understanding of what these concepts even mean. And in this sense, it's China changing both the internet and what we understand can happen on the internet. Additionally, China has caused us, I think, to rethink some of our fundamental assumptions about what the internet is and how it ought to be governed. China has, of course, pushed this idea of internet sovereignty and it has helped to poke at some of the assumptions that we, we thought the internet underpinned the internet, such as its interconnectivity. The market access that at least characterized the early years of the internet seems to be implicitly challenged and obviously sometimes explicitly challenged by China. And the totality of this is that we're actually learning that China changed the internet 30 years later. Okay, so we began by thinking the internet would change China. We learned about these sort of repression or liberation axis and then the sort of social groups on the internet. Then we started to understand, in fact, that China had changed the internet as well. And as we were thinking about this, we started to wonder what assumptions underlay these 30 years of mutual transformation. And something we think is we argue is important is engagement. That the reason these mutual transformations have occurred, or rather a presupposition for them occurring, is that both China and the globe, the outside China, have constantly engaged on the internet, and citizens and the Chinese government have constantly engaged on the internet. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen now because it's gonna get there's a few things I want to mention here. Hopefully this comes through. So as I said, the first is China and the world. And what did this look like? Well, there was all kinds of interconnections. For one, the supply chain for the internet's actual substance and materials was deeply interwoven. This is the fiber optic cables, the semiconductor chips, the actual materials from which the internet is constructed. Multinational firms, from the United States, from Europe, and including from China with ByteDance, had spanned the globe. And this kind of interconnection also characterized the 30 years of China's internet. Data access across borders remained definitely possible, sometimes, of course, with the firewall intermittent, but it nevertheless was a feature of these 30 years. And then, of course, human capital flows, so people moving across borders. Many of China's internet pioneers had spent time in the United States or in Europe. And then the second time of engagement is between citizens and the government. So for whatever flaws citizens may have seen in the internet or whatever criticisms they might have had about its governance, they nevertheless treated it as a place where they could pursue meaningful and positive change for themselves, their, their, their society, and, and, and the country itself. And as a result of this, the internet was a forum for people to produce oversight via social media of government behavior. It led to changes in policies. There, of course, was a robust investigative journalism 
uh, coming out of Nanfang Zhongmu and then also the self media and just a robust ecosystem of citizens looking to the internet to improve their lives. And then of course there are identity groups who found each other on the internet and were able to find a sense of connection and community. And the internet again was a place to do that. Okay, so now you've noticed I've been using the past tense. I maybe should be using the present tense. I don't think either of us, I don't think we're trying to commit to this being a past tense thing. But we are noticing that some of these engagements are appear to be heading into reverse. And we say this is very early. It's far too early to say this is definitely happening. But we notice that supply chains are delinking. Multinational firms aren't putting funds into China in the way that they used to be. Open source access to data is diminishing now. And human capital flows are also declining. When I was in China over the summer, I, I heard this, I don't know if this is true, but I heard there was 300 American students in the entire country of China, which if is the case would be a, a drastic decline. So China and the world appear to be disengaging in at least some meaningful ways. At the same time, citizens and the government are also, we think there are some early signs that there might be disengagement happening. So public oversight of the zero COVID policy didn't appear to result in any changes to zero COVID for many, many months. Investigative journalism, as we know, is, is in decline. And many of the identity groups that first found themselves on the internet are finding their communities under threat. Okay, so we call these proto trends because it's not at all clear that this is actually trend. And it is very early. Much of the signs here is coming from news media and journalism. Um, and research is sort of picking up on this. And we see this in research on rural influencers, which we think might be similar or adjacent to this type of disengagement. People attempting to leave the city to go to the countryside. Of course, declining birth rates, pessimism among the young that their lives will be worse than their parents. And then, of course, the lying flat uh, culture that we've seen in the recent years. Okay, so is this happening? Um, I picked out this quote from one of the pieces we were reading as we put together this contribution and I'm thrilled to find that the author is actually in the audience today. And I put this up here because when I read this, I kind of circled and said, look, you know, that could be written today. But of course, this was in 2011, and the country has faced these kinds of challenges before and has overcome them, or has the, the sort of proto trends turned out to not be real trends. And so for that reason, we really mean to pose this as a question about whether disengagement is happening, and if so, what its consequences might be. Now, before I conclude, I'll just say there are three reasons why we think this matters. One is that the Chinese internet is vibrant because people think it's vibrant. They think that they can pursue meaningful positive change there. And as a result, people go. And also as a result, the Chinese government can use the internet as an opportunity. They can learn about public opinion. They can provide public oversight over lower level governments. All these positive externalities or attributes to the internet is because people think that it's still worthwhile. And so one question is if they no longer treat the internet the same way as they used to, what are the consequences for what we have learned about Chinese internet governance over the last 30 years? The second question is what happens to speech if it is repressed for a long period of time? I think we all have noticed that the space for conversation on the Chinese internet has shrunk in recent years. Where does it go? And if you cannot speak, do you no longer speak at all or do you find other avenues for it? In other words, is it the metaphor of 
increased pressure that builds up and builds up? Or is it more like a mask that once you pretend or you no longer can act in a certain way, the mask sort of becomes you? And we think that's an open question that may become more salient if this trend proves to be true. And the third is this question of offline protests. We saw in the end of 2022, these white paper protests that were some of the largest that China had witnessed in almost 30 years. And it was preceded by growing discontent on the internet about these zero COVID policies. And the policies didn't change. Of course, that doesn't mean that the lack of change caused the protests or that the internet censorship caused people to go to the streets, but it could be related. And we think that could also be a fruitful area for future research. So in summary, when the Chinese, when internet began in China, we thought that the internet would change China. We learned actually that China had also changed the internet. And one assumption that underlay it was that this, these two groups would constantly engage both between China and the world and between citizens and the government. And the question we want to ask is, if that assumption is relaxed and citizens disengage, what might we learn? And what of our conclusions might no longer hold? Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt and Professor Pan. And our next speaker, I'll turn on our next uh, speaker is Professor Jack Chiu. And uh, everyone, uh, it's uh, Saturday morning in Singapore now, and I have to uh, start with an apology because I uh, manually uh, made a mistake when I entered the event into my uh, Google uh, calendar. And I always thought it's going to be Saturday night that I can. Uh, I can only join you uh, through video this time, and I want to apologize for my own uh, human error in data entry. Uh, I have a title here and also a script, so I'm going to basically read my script. You will notice there is a, a slight uh, change in my title. Uh, uh, in the program, it says the uh, constants of Chinese internet research, but today I only have time to talk about three constants. Right? So the three constants I'm going to address are number one, statism, and number two, cacophony, uh, the sun is a sun in the sun, and number three, liminal movements. I think in Chinese it can be translated into something like uh, so now let me begin. The beginning of the internet in China was enabled by scientists and professors from such elite institutions as Tsinghua University and uh, popularized by visionary entrepreneurs as, uh, such as Jasmine Zhang Shuxin, founder of Info Highway Communications Corporation, Ying Highway, China's first nationwide ISP. Both groups enjoyed transnational ties with the West, and they perched near the top echelon of Chinese society. Against the global backdrop of the receding Cold War, the Chinese party state prioritized telecommunications as a strategic sector. This defined the dominant thoughts at the time, uh, cyber uh, libertarianism. So this runs against this cyber libertarian e ideology at the time, which assumed that the internet would evade sovereignty, bypass control, and threaten the continuation of CCP rule. Meanwhile, scholars such as Zhu Guanglie, uh, Communication University of China, and uh, Min Da Hong from uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, they emerged as the first pioneering intellectuals in Beijing who theorized about the importance of uh, internet you know, uh, and its impact on Chinese media and society since the 1990s. 
With China entering the WTO in 2001, internet buildup accelerated in bandwidth, geographical expansion, and world-leading uh, mobile services such as QQ. Based on a Yahoo e-group for researchers and journalists working on China-related internet issues, the Chinese Internet Research Conference began to take place annually for more than two decades since uh, 2003. As a co-founder and steer steering committee member of this conference series, I had the fortune of attending 19 of these conferences in three continents, North America, Asia, Europe, and I look forward to the next one uh, in Australia. We also did some of this online, you know, during COVID, of course. In retrospect, although there are time and again expectations for abrupt change caused by technology or government policy, three constants seem to have persisted in studies of Chinese internet and society. First, statism. Few would doubt that the authoritarian and paternalistic tendencies of the Chinese party state have strengthened over the years. Researchers, therefore, continue to work from the assumption of China being a statist society led by a party state that can be developmental and or repressive. Its internet industry operating under government influence with the authorities controlling digital economy while setting the hegemonic tone of internet culture. Studies of censorship, great firewall, and social media propaganda remain in high demand and high supply, which extends to more or less creative ways to evade control that may challenge top-down power domination while also perpetuating the intellectual expectation for Chinese netizens to lack in their freedom, okay, to only be able to dance with chance at best. Behind such thinking for or, for or against statism is the competition between Chinese and Western conceptions of neoliberal progress, progress in quotation marks here, okay, in efforts to shape consumerism and postmodern postmodernity online and off, in response to U.S.-China relations shifting from Chin America collaboration during the Hu Jintao Obama period to geopolitical rivalry in recent years, no matter state society or interstate dynamics, this analytical focus is trained on the policy structures and the processes of Chinese authorities who have become increasingly ambitious and in some case, cases potently so as well in imposing their will both covertly through means of internet culture and coercively through political, economic and legal regulatory, even military means under the banner of na national security as is the case increasingly in other parts of the world, including in the U.S. This state-centered approach, be it China bashing or panda loving, is however no longer the only or the most dominant perspective in Chinese internet research. This takes us to the second constant, cacophony. Uh, this is about uh, the variety, okay, all kinds of voices in Chinese society and online groups now mediated and amplified by social media platforms, where they also offset and render each other inaudible. What Hu Yong calls Zhong Shen Xuan Hua is about the chaotic coexistence of personal expressions and public discourse and the tension in between the two, which is further magnified nowadays through AI algorithms. Some may contend that China never has public communication in the Western sense for its lack of democratic institutions. But one must not deny that there are indeed multiple voices of consumerism, individualism, and cultural silos 
of various scale, all contending to you know for for their five minutes of uh, or five seconds of fame. From the latest uh, media events to uh, Tang Ping lying flat and uh, Bai Lan let it rot. Okay, this cacophony gets worse due to increasingly shortened attention span among internet users, encouraging myopic pursuits, clickbait headlines, and the re repetition of identity markers, be they gender, ethnicity, place of origin, this can be regional, okay, which province you're from, or uh, rural versus urban identities. Okay, it can also be religion uh, or profession or class-based discourses. As scholars, we, of course, must study these voices, these very diverse voices, this cacophony, okay, empirically, we have to study them, especially due to the spread of working class ICTs that allows unofficial opinion expression and discourse formation from the bottom up. But if our work is captured within this endless politics of difference, within more or less nationalistic imaginations of Chineseness, for example, then there is the perennial danger that the real voices of Chinese society will be lost in the uh, uh, raucousness of platform enhanced noises. Okay. Like in the Coliseum of ancient Rome, where countless decentralized conversations might occur simultaneously to form the marvelous ambience, whereas the real show of the gladiators, okay, that is on at the center of the Coliseum, remains a highly centralized projection of imperialist state power. Is our scholarship about the cacophony going to become part of the debilitating ambience as well? Will any of our research findings be able to stand the test of time? These are durable challenges for Chinese internet research. The third constant has to do with social movements. These are movements with uh, long-term goals for sustainable structural change, more social and environmental justice, for instance, okay, not just in five seconds or five minutes or even five years, but five decades and perhaps longer. These movements are constantly in the face of liminality, precarity, flux, and historical openings. Overlapping with the first two constants, these movements may rely on state discourse and or corporate data infrastructures for certain activities. But deferring most crucially from the first two, they must also operate with autonomy, unconstrained by the party line and independent from the logics of platformization. They can choose to be the digital equivalents of the Tsamistat in Eastern Europe before the fall of the Berlin Wall. In so doing, the solidarity okay, uh, uh, communities would emerge above and beyond individual concerns, transcending statist strategy and corporate agenda. In doing so, the agentic creativity arises from the subcultures and countercultures, drawing from the repertoires of cultural globalization on the basis of interlocal networks for alternative representations, radical uh, reimaginations, grassroots mobilization, including through smartphones and unorthodox uh, collective memories of all kinds. This may even lead to new subjectivities for good or for bad, which few of us could anticipate now. It is, however, also possible, okay, this is very important to bear in mind, that such liminal movements may either have no impact whatsoever or they may create the opposite effects. For instance, self-proclaimed -pro progressives ended up triggering a cons conservative backlash more than anything else. This we have seen many times before. Such projects are, quote unquote, 
uh, politics without guarantee, as Stuart Hall puts it. What can be learned from these liminal movements, from their successes and failures, their strategies and contingencies, their implications for future students studying China and for the world? This is another everlasting question for Chinese internet research 30 years on. So statism, cacophony, liminal movements, the three constants of our field. They are not an exhaustive list, nor are they mutually exclusive. Reflecting on these constants, among others, shall help us better appreciate the variations and dynamisms of Chinese internet research from the past into the future. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Jack Cho, who recorded uh, his uh, speech because he's in the middle of the travel right now as we speak. Thank you very much again. Our next speaker will be Professor Yun Ya Song from Hong Kong Baptist University. Thank you, Professor Yang, and thank you to the Center on Digital Culture and Society for organizing this very meaningful event. Uh, so today is a pleasure for me to share with you some of our reflections um, on this topic that is, I actually we changed a bit our topic, uh, updated a bit about our title is Women on China's Internet Consumption, Contestation and Challenges for Empowerment. And my co-authors are two colleagues um, back at my home institution, Hong Kong Baptist University, Dr. Li Jiarui and Dr. Zhou Sheng. Uh, in 1994, uh, China gained full functional access to the internet, established its first web server, and launched its inaugural set of web pages. Uh, decades later, over, as you can see the figure here, over 1 million city Chinese citizens had access to the internet, marking a very significant milestone in the country's digital evolution. So this remarkable expansion has reshaped the gender dynamics in the digital realm as well, in tandem, as we know, the post-socialist uh, states agenda, uh, the market forces, and revitalize the patriarchal values as well. And the gap mm, between the male and female internet users has decreased uh, from a three to seven ratio and in 2000 and to near equality by 2023, according to the China Internet Center's figure. So, this actually leads to a very important inquiry. While statistically, uh, it indicates a positive trend towards gender balance in internet access in terms of internet access alone, but does this equate to women holding up half of sky in China's cyberspace today? Um, so um, by this, uh, by actually doing this reflection, uh, our aim and framework uh, is actually um, to examine not only the access ratios, but also the gender differences in China's digital realm, realm now in terms of usage, practices, and outcomes, and whether similar benefits are achieved um, by women and men. So the objective is to integrate the macro-level user figures as well as micro-level user-centric perspectives. We aim to provide a thorough assessment of gendered presence and practices online and evaluate the impact of China's digital advancements on women. Um, as we know that since the 1980s, gender dynamics have led to actually an increased disadvantages for women. Um, despite the closing education gaps, actually disparities in terms of workforce participation and unemployment and income between genders have widened in China. A significant gender disparity in internet access was very evident in the year late uh, 1990s and early 2000s. Um, it was only after the mid-1920s this gap has progressively narrowed. And um, afterwards, um, due to partly it was due to the efforts in China to promote the digital skill training and access for women, especially in rural areas. 
And despite these advancements, geographical and socioeconomic disparity in internet access continue to exist. For example, there is a consistent digital rural urban divide with rural women still facing challenges in accessing the internet. And another example is men actually support women in internet usage across all age groups. Although there were more internet users uh, with a middle level of education, um, however, those women were online um, for those with low educational levels, they faced a very uh, notable disadvantage. Um, so I will not uh, spend time to illustrate these examples, but in our essay, actually we reviewed um, all these figures um, on this kind of uh, patterns. So this discrepancy underscored the complex nature of the multiple overlapping uh, divides in internet access. And also we reviewed all the findings about how Chinese men and women utilize the internet differently. Uh, for example, um, the gender disparities in preferred usage of internet applications, like men and women, how they use different uh, internet differently. Men prefer gaming and women prefer social media and shopping. And another aspect we review is the internet proficiency in the time spent online and how it evolved over the past uh, three decades, as well as the gender disparities in um, social media usage. And this part is quite interesting because we find a very diverse pictures. Uh, for example, their preferences from uh, for different apps and also their content uh, production activity nowadays in Xiaohongshu and all this uh, different diversity of social media platforms, as well as their activity in the live streaming industry. For example, Chinese women now account for over 70% of streamers, uh, but um, men actually they gain more revenues in terms of live streaming industry. Uh, so in, in this essay, we actually reviewed all those findings regarding all these aspects. So because of the time limits, I will not show but as you can see the examples here, um, we actually review the gender disparities in content creation and the differences in online health community engagement, as well as their political engagement uh, disparities, um, how they participate in online political activities, as well as um, some special groups are like female uh, migrant uh, workers and their expectation for social media platforms. And then, uh, another aspect we um, actually uh, review um, is about um, another explore uh, is the potential evolution of internet usage patterns, such as a uh, very interesting trends nowadays in, in the gender disparity, like the shift in online gaming demographics. Recent surveys show that women now represent nearly half the player in China's mobile gaming industry, um, as well as on the impact of China's one-child policy on the potential evolution of internet usage patterns, as well as the social live streaming service usage. And then another dimension we explore is about uh, the returns to their usage, um, the benefits derived from internet usage, how they vary between men and women in China. So several aspects we look at. Uh, one is the economic benefits of the internet usage. And another is the enhancement of um, family status enhancement. So internet access and usage has actually um, empowered women to recognize their value within the family and society as a lot of surveys have shown. So this heightened self-awareness and income um, indirectly improves their status within the family. And also we review the findings on the psychological out outcomes. For example, women experienced a uh, benefit from improved well-being and increased demographic uh, awareness through online engagement uh, much more evidently than men. However, men may experience greater improvements in subjective well-being from active social media use. Uh, while uh, all this kind of aggregated statistics, while well, I would do this review, these statistics offer insights and however, we hold that a detailed user-centric perspective is also very crucial for understanding gender dynamics in China's internet usage. So we did a review uh, of the previous findings uh, uh, focusing on using the user-centric perspective to look into the gender disparities. 
So I'd like to talk about actually three aspects because of the time limits. Uh, one is women's online consumption, and, and then is um, uh, beyond the presumption of a profound liberal user and the mutual shaping in this field. Um, as we know that um, the internet is central to China's economic development, framed within what we know, the information society narrative. So middle-class women, particularly in China, empowered by the increasing incomes and the girl power, are targeted by marketers these days in the expanding digital China's economy. So terms as what we know that women's consumerism and the Xi economy underscore the critical role of female consumers in driving economic growth and social stability. And the transition from the male gaze to the female gaze signifies a shift in gender power dynamics in China, acknowledging women's agency beyond their roles as consumers. And the second aspect is the concept of what we know as a presumption of performed liberal users often introduces a Western-centric view of Chinese internet users, highlighting the use of new technology means to challenge the state, um, the state authority. And the diverse practices of female users and the presence of anti-feminist movements online in China actually um, uncover the complexities that surpass the simplistic liberal user uh, versus the state binary. So in this essay, we also reviewed uh, the previous studies and findings of the digital, current digital feminist activity uh, in China from a historical perspective, as well as the anti-feminist wave. Uh, for the digital feminism activism, uh, we are all very familiar with the Me Too movement in China. So it kind of illustrates the dual nature of the internet as a tool for challenging established gender norms and as a medium with limitations in addressing structural gender inequalities. And as for the anti-feminist uh, wave, we also uh, analyze um, uh, a series of very interesting cases. Uh, for example, since uh, 2014, the anti-feminist movement has used pre uh, derogatory terms like rural feminism to disparage women's advocacy. And anti-feminists label feminists as traitorous and liken them to Islamists, branding them as fake feminists in efforts to malign and depoliticize the feminist cause online in China today now. So by analyzing um, this kind of question, the, fi the final question and uh, the basic question we try to pursue here is a uh, question whether it's a kind of dis empowerment or disempowerment of women in China. Uh, so by analyzing this kind of cases, we want to argue that the complex interactions between female users and platform and state power call for a very comprehensive approach that explores the nuanced effects of empowerment or disempowerment and the reciprocal influence between the internet and women in China. And adopting a user-centric a perspective and a constructivist and society model aids in analyzing this kind of dynamics between the internet and women in China. The approach values uh, the approach values the female users' autonomy and as well as examines how they form connections based on shared interests, which we will analyze in details in our essay. Um, for the uh, time being, I'd just like to share some very brief conclusions and implications like the development of gender roles and internet usage in China over the last three decades has been remarkable. Yet the extent to which Chinese women have attained their true equality in the digital realm is still debatable and warrants several critical and empirical investigations. While almost equal access to the internet, as we can see from the figures, has been achieved across genders, subtle and underlying disparities in internet use persist between men and women characterized um, as what we analyzed in our essay, like geographical and socioeconomic context, usage habits, economic benefits, and distinct psychological impacts on women. The internet offering new avenues for female empowerment. However, its effect is very intricate, shaped by governmental, commercial, and societal norms. So a nuanced understanding of these complex processes um, of empowerment within platform society through the lens of a user-focused and moderately constructive approach is very crucial for understanding the internet's role among the diverse online communities of Chinese women. Uh, so that's what I'd like to share. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Song from Hong Kong Baptist University. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Wang Wei from Zhejiang University. Thank you so much for having me at this event. Let me share my screen. Okay, um, so can you see my slides? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Ya, and thank you so much to the Center on Digital Culture and the Society and the Center for the Study of Contemporary China. Really proud to be part of this project and event on the 30th anniversary of Chinese Internet Studies. And today I want to share our research on Chinese Internet Studies from the local dimension and also look forward to your comments and suggestions. And here's the structure of our presentation today. Um, back to the year of 1994, Professor Perry proposed an advocacy to study intersocietal trends in studying Chinese politics. It is actually in the same year of 1994 that China connected itself to the internet. The utopian promise of the internet to build a global village by overcoming geographical boundaries undermined the local variation surrounding to an international or at least national discourse. Against the background of the inflation of such a promise, early studies of the internet and media in China mainly stayed at the national level. Another factor that further obscures the importance of local structures in Chinese internet studies is the waning of local mainstream media, represented by local television stations. This decline in legacy media more or less legitimizes a scholarly focus on national level studies. With the emergence of idiosyncratic and internet-related practices at different locales, the quest for a more geographically nuanced landscape in Chinese internet research gradually emerged. The publication of a series of milestone works directly directed scholarly attention to the multiple geographic levels below the national in the early 2010s. In particular, the publication of Mapping Media in China, Region, Province, Locality, edited by Professor Wen Sun and Professor Jenny Cho, marks a concerted effort to go below the national scale to focus on the rich diversity of media in China from local, provincial, and regional angles. This spatial turn responds to the spatially diversified media practices along the conventional administrative hierarchy of the village, town, county, municipal, and provincial. However, the notion of locality remains underdeveloped and underarticulated, assigned with different connotations. And not a small number of studies, local is used as a left point of a spectrum from local, provincial, regional, to national, or global. In other cases, local is attached to media-related material carriers, such as local channels mentioned in Professor Yue Zhi Zhao's book, which are mainly provincial-level TV channels. Here comes an interchangeable use between local and provincial, which marks a contrast between the central television station and provincial stations. Furthermore, the definitions of locality summarized by previous studies share a common assumption. They perceive locality as an existing geog geographical scale that serves as a context of media practices within the larger framework of the nation state or international map. And we argue that locality can be the scaffolding to understand the social implications of internet-based new media on the vast local society in China. So we propose an alternative approach, a formative view to understanding locality. Besides network locality and hybrid location in analyzing media at the local level in China, a formative view has also emerged. 
The local media landscape at the county level results from the interplay between top-down digitalization projects and bottom-up grassroots entrepreneurship. So we follow this formative view of locality with an aim to understand the social processes implicated in the formation of locality. Furthermore, we would like to argue that these processes also stipulate new rules of new territories. It is a local reverberation of Benedict Anderson's concept of imagined communities. In the history of the internet in China, an important piece is that of internet-based forums, official accounts, short video platforms, and applications for the local community, which have been categorized as internet-based local media. And at the county level, communities are also under continuous construction together with the changing affordable media infrastructures. With us place of light on the county level, Contrary to this piece of the puzzle of Chinese internet, scant attention goes to internet-based local media, particularly before the wave of county-level media conversion centers. So we hope to further clear the myth around local media. Through examining the history of internet-based local media at the county level, we argue that the practices associated with them have reinvented locality. The notion of locality has a long-standing history rooted in the local society. In response to the argument that nations are invented and imagined rather than simply existing by Anderson, we also attempt to articulate the relationship between internet-based local media and locality, which overlaps with but also diverges from the concepts of community and place. So here, um, like from the decline of local mass media to the established legitimacy of internet-based local media. So we want to explore how the locality is reinvented in three senses. First, in a social spatial sense, the locality is reinvented into a contextualized experience through an imagined relocating of the local along the global national local continuum, which is articulated by the formation of internet-based local media. This contextualized experience is collective and everyday. It is collective as it is formed in interactions among local users on internet-based local media. It is every day because this locality is constructed through exchanges over everyday practices unfolding at the local level. Media might drive the formation of differences across different regions. However, media might also be the homo homogenizing force. The official accounts, short video accounts, and so forth actually mold a more similar set of locality. Digital platforms, particularly WeChat and Douyin, play a key role in the reinvention and materialization of geographical scales. Second, in a social economic sense, digital platforms that monetize on local businesses such as Meituan and El Elema can also be categorized as a specific type of internet-based local media. They represent the commercial logic of how to make a business out of locality. Internet-based local media, primarily including WeChat official accounts and short video accounts, have also afforded grassroots indigenous media to activate local small business advertising initiatives and develop a local market with a commodification of local residents. In this process, a changing trajectory from web-based early BBS forums to digital platforms creates an ecosystem of local businesses. This is a social economic building of locality, which is an interplay with internet-based local media. It also represents a new turn towards neoconservatism, if not the local coloring of neoliberalism. This formative view from the social economic aspect manifests the commodification of locality from a critical light. 
Third, in a social political sense, the process of local mainstream media replaced by internet-based local media, including both official media conversion centers and grassroots indigenous media, is simultaneous decentralizing and centralizing. On the one hand, the dissolving of local mainstream media undermines local discursive power and submits to a more national vision of media development, particularly national digitalization projects. On the other hand, the rise of internet-based local media symbolizes an ambition to grasp local discursive power by county-level local actors. A difference between this stage and the earlier one dominated by local TV stations lies in the agentic role of grassroots indigenous media launched by local celebrities, some of whom are successful in seizing a career and business on local media. Therefore, from this social political aspect, localities reinvented by the twin composing of two different types of local media. In this regard, the invention, reinvention of locality is actually a political project. Uh, in summary, we draw on the history of internet-based local media at the county level in China to investigate the social implications of the internet for the local society. We take a formative approach and analyze the social processes of the reinvention of locality from the spatial, economic, and political aspects. We view locality not only as the assemblage of different places, but also a theoretical scaffolding, which can stimulate a refreshed imaginary of geography and media. The scales are reinvented or redefined by the digital fabrics of these social platforms, which align geographic scales for content producers, including grassroots and official stakeholders. So localities reimagined with internet-based local media. Locality is more than a state of pre-existence that contrasts and complements centrality. Instead, our archaeology of internet-based local media reveals the changing connotations of locality which is reinvention resulting from the interaction between local users, local media entrepreneurs, technology service providers, and government initiatives. Through discussing what is considered as locality in a spatial, economic, and a political senses from the social perspective, we have explored the mutual shaping of internet-based media practices and the physical world. The social implications of internet manifest themselves profoundly in the reinvention of locality. So therefore, we want to propose locality as a heuristic note linking internet studies, media history, media sociology, critical geography, and more fields of studies to stimulate potential new research topics that can address how Chinese society at the local level was changing in the past, is changing in the present, and where it will be going in the future. And that's the presentation for today. We look forward to your comments and suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wang Wei of Zhejiang University. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Xu Jian from Deakin University of Australia. Hello, uh, Professor Yang and the team for organizing such a wonderful uh, workshop. It's a great honor to be involved in the event. So can you see my sharing? Yeah. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, today, I'd like to uh, share some of my thoughts on Wang Hong studies in China uh, based on my own research on Chinese digital media and communication research and also celebrity studies in China uh, in the past few years. Um, I think everyone is familiar with the Chinese term Wang Hong, uh, which means people with internet fame and popularity. Um, 
it is equivalent to a few English terms like internet celebrity, key opinion leaders, and influences in English academic writing on Wang Hong. <clears throat> but I concur with uh, Dr. Kajang's suggestion that we should use the vernacular Wang Hong in its own terms uh, rather than uh, trying to translate it into an English counterpart because the term has um, already gone beyond its original meaning and requires ongoing uh, conceptual creation and recreation. The history of uh, Chinese Wang Hong is actually as long as the history of the Chinese internet. Um, scholars usually divide Chinese Wang Hong into uh, three generations uh, from 1.0 uh, to 3.0 eras. So in Web 1.0 era from uh, 1994, China connected to the world internet to early 2000s, Wang Hong uh, mainly refers to um, famous online writers on BBS forums and some dedicated internet literature portal sites uh, such as uh, Annie Baobei. Um, in Web 2.0 era from 2004 to 2010, um, blog and video hosting website became popular and some uh, grassroots uh, could obtain sudden online fame uh, through their attention grabbing images or very personalized speeches on these platforms um, such as Furong Jiejie and uh, Feng Jie. And since 2010s onwards, um, Wang Hong has entered into the third generation. Um, they refer to content creators, uh, live streamers, um, social media entrepreneurs who actively use social media platform, live streaming, uh, short video apps and other social media platforms to promote their visibility and self-branding for monetization. Um, this chronological periodization from uh, 1.0 to 3.0, even though it um, ignores the crossover among the three euros and the trans-platform practices of Wang Hong across the three uh, generations, it importantly reflects the, the changing relations between the evolution of digital infrastructures, uh, platforms, uh, the affordances they can provide to users um, and the practice of being famous online for uh, individual internet users. Existing research on Wang Hong studies um, focuses on the third generation uh, Wang Hong. Uh, the publication uh, on Wang Hong topics in English uh, academia started to uh, proliferate since 2016. Uh, the year widely adopted by the Chinese media as year one of uh, Wang Hong in China. The timeline is uh, roughly in parallel to the global rise of platform studies. Um, Wang Hong are widely studied as visibility labor, uh, entrepreneurial labor, creative labor, who follow the platform logics to monetize their online fame. And researchers are usually used uh, qualitative methods such as digital ethnography, interview, uh, content analysis to uh, examine uh, various aspects of Wang Hong uh, culture and economy. Um, based on my review of the existing literature uh, and the research gap I found, I would like to propose two turns in uh, Wang Hong studies in the Chinese context. First, uh, I found the current research uh, often ignores the connections between Wang Hong studies and celebrity studies, uh, a well-established interdisciplinary uh, field uh, in which researchers study the key issues in the uh, production, circulation, and consumption of fame and the roles performed by celebrities in shaping uh, cultural, economic, and uh, political practices. As a researcher working on Chinese digital media and celebrity studies, I have been arguing that um, it's important to uh, 
take Wang Hong culture as an evolution of Chinese celebrity culture and incorporate Wang Hong studies into uh, what we call China celebrity studies. I made the call to uh, turn to celebrity studies um, because my own research on the governance of Wang Hong, such as uh, Chibo and Han Mai uh, Wang Hong, found that they need to navigate the, the complex trade-off uh, between the neoliberal market ideology and the party ideology in the Chinese market for uh, survival and success, just as the traditional stars and celebrities. And the legacy of socialist role models and the state media uh, celebra celebrity public relations uh, also cast a long shadow on Wang Hong and have greatly influenced uh, Wang Hong's uh, presentation, uh, performance, culture, uh, regulation, and governance. So bringing Wang Hong back to celebrity studies could help go beyond the creator-centric approach in current Wang Hong studies, uh, mainly in the field of platform studies and digital labor studies, to critically examine their roles uh, in China. And academic resources in celebrity studies, uh, such as celebrity activism, philanthropy, uh, diplomacy, and politics, would shed a great light on uh, our understanding of Wang Hong politics in China. For example, um, Wang Hong philanthropy, uh, using Wang Hong live streaming for poverty uh, alleviation, uh, and also Wang Hong role models, um, Foreign Wang Hong, who uh, helped the government to do uh, external publicity and diplomacy work. Uh, these are understudied topics in the current uh, Wang Hong studies in China. And the second turn I would like to um, call is to study what I call Wang Hong thinking, uh, uh, Wang Hong Siwei, because Wang Hong um, is no longer a noun referring to famous uh, internet celebrities. It has already become an adjective and prefix to refer to some uh, non-human objects which gained uh, online popularity and fame, uh, such as Wang Hong uh, tourism sports, uh, Wang Hong cafes. Um, people um, name this urban digital spectacles as Wang Hong urbanism. Um, an interesting phenomenon I realized in recent years is that the, the governments and the government officials at various levels have um, increasingly adopted the self-branding strategies of human Wang Hong and also the commercial and aesthetic logic of Wang Hong urbanism to promote uh, party propaganda, public diplomacy, local tourism, and economy. So here I define Wang Hong thinking, uh, specifically referring to the mindset uh, that guide the party's experiment of incorporating the popular Wang Hong culture, logic, and economic model for achieving uh, various social, political, and economic objectives. Uh, for example, to make China's uh, wolf warrior diplomacy known by more domestic audience and promote nationalistic sentiment, uh, China's outspoken foreign ministry uh, spokesperson uh, Zhao Lijian was made a Wang Hong diplomat and was widely reported and discussed online. Um, another example is CCTV um, cultivates a few anchormen from its news programs to become uh, Wang Hong, witty talkers on uh, Douyin to make state media closer to audience and also weaken its uh, propagandist image. Um, another example I want to use is the creation of Wang Hong tourist cities, uh, such as uh, Zibo and Harbin, uh, which were very, very popular last year on Chinese social media platforms. They well demonstrate the power of Wang Hong thinking uh, in boosting local tourism industry. Um, how to understand uh, Wang Hong thinking? Um, I think Wang Hong thinking can be seen as a result and uh, continuation of the 
national uh, implementation of Internet Plus, a concept and strategy proposed by uh, the CCP in 2015 to drive economic um, and social innovation and development by using uh, digital information technologies. And the national implementation of Internet Plus in uh, social governance and many other industries, such as uh, Internet Plus tourism, Internet Plus agriculture, has equated the governments and uh, government officials uh, with what is popularly called Internet thinking. Um, so in this sense, Wang Hong thinking can be seen as an evolutionary practice of uh, Internet Plus and Internet thinking. Um, I, I would argue that Wang Hong thinking essentially uh, demonstrates the metricated mindset um, that the government have learned from the uh, platform logics of Wang Hong economy to uh, quantify the success of their propaganda, uh, government public relations, um, economic development uh, with uh, Liu Liao. So studying um, Wang Hong thinking could help to link Wang Hong studies to uh, contemporary China studies to critically investigate the impacts of Wang Hong culture, uh, logic, and uh, economic model in China. So in conclusion, uh, I'd like to advocate that uh, Wang Hong studies should go beyond its dominant disciplines in uh, platform studies and digital labor studies to embrace celebrity studies and China studies, especially through the perspective of Wang Hong thinking. Um, last but not least, I also want to uh, express my concern on the popularity of uh, Wang Hong thinking. I worry that it will promote the short-termism and uh, technological solutionism, uh, which encourage the, the government and government officials to pursue immediate attention economy effects through digitally enabled performance rather than making uh, long-term and fundamental changes. So once the public uh, have aesthetic fatigue on the platform performance and the Wang Hong model is becoming less and less effective, so what will be the next uh, Liu Liang passcode for the CCP's social and economic innovation and development? I, I think this is a question uh, that is worth of our uh, consideration and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Xu Jian of Deakin University. Our um, final speaker for tonight's session um, is Professor Wei Yu Zhang from National University of Singapore. Wei Yu, I turn uh, this over to you. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Gobin. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me clear, clearly? Yes. Okay, great. Um, basically, uh, I want to thank. Uh, Gobin uh, Center for Digital Culture and Society at UPenn, uh, as well as this wonderful team for putting up this very timely and important event. Um, here I also do a shameless plug in. Uh, Professor Xu Jian, our speaker just now, uh, with uh, Shao Hua Guo, Professor Shao Hua Guo and myself, are actually editing a Sage Handbook, which also uh, pays a lot of attention on this issue, this topic. Uh, as well as uh, featuring actually many speakers involved in this uh, great event as well. So uh, I think we just have heard uh, various uh, perspectives uh, to China's uh, internet research uh, in the past 30 years. My focus today is really just on China's online fandom. Okay, so um, China's online fandom actually started with uh, quite a humble beginnings, uh, probably uh, due to the technology we have back then. So in the 1990s, if you remember, <laughs> uh, the um, popular culture back then were uh, dominated by Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, content and their idols. So um, uh, uh, the first uh, so-called, one of the first uh, dedicated fan website to uh, idols was uh, one called Ai Ling Quan. Um, Ai Ling Quan uh, refers to uh, the fan community supporting Ling Qingxia, the Taiwanese uh, movie star. So uh, the website is no longer in function, but the community is still around, uh, moved uh, into other platforms such as uh, WeChat. Um, other than dedicated websites, we also have seen 
um, uh, preliminary uh, so-called discussion spaces like bulletin board systems, where you can find uh, various uh, people come to discuss their favorite idols and the content, so on and so forth, right? So um, as popular culture, the wave of popular culture itself evolved over time, we started to see that uh, Chinese fans expanding their interest from all these uh, Chinese language content, Chinese uh, pan-Chinese idols, to what we call the pan-Asian content and idols, basically Japanese and Korean, right? Uh, Japan, uh, call, uh, J Japan uh, pop and Korean wave. Um, then later on, uh, we also started to see um, the uh, shift from uh, pan-Asian content uh, to Western content as well, mostly from UK and US. So uh, back then, uh, if you remember, our government actually had quite uh, uh, strict control over the import and uh, traditional media representation of these so-called foreign content, basically out of the concern of uh, cultural imperialism, cultural pollution. Right. So they restricted the flow of these uh, transcultural content into China. Then how did the Chinese fans back then find this content, enjoy this content? Uh, the emergence of the internet really contributed to this need. Uh, so the fans uh, can use uh, technologies, internet te internet technologies to organize uh, themselves as well to as, as well as to import to get the access to these content they cannot easily uh, access in other channels, in other official traditional channels. Right. So uh, that's basically trans cultural fandom. That's one uh, so called side of the phenomenon we can observe. The other side of the phenomenon, in the meantime, as the local cultural industry continues to grow, we also start to see the localization of fandom. We all know how Super Warriors uh, Girl 2 has become such a watershedding uh, event right, in Chinese online fandom. So this turning point basically uh, suggested that Chinese local cultural industry is capable of producing widely popular uh, local idols for the local fans. Um, although the production of uh, 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 idols are mostly local, right? I, I want to uh, just remind everyone that at this point, uh, the local culture uh, industry still borrows a lot from the so-called transculture or, or uh, international uh, culture industry in terms of both uh, capital uh, and uh, popular cultural strategies, uh, styles, content, format, so on and so forth. So these two uh, phenomena um, basically contribute to the growth and uh, strengthening of uh, fan communities and uh, self-organization. Um, so within these two phenomena, I noticed uh, uh, not only uh, the, the so-called the capacity of organizing fans themselves, but also due to such capacity, but diverging interests, right? Uh, the conflicts among these uh, fan of opportunities. So uh, I here uh, I'll give you an example of the fan translation community when uh, fans were uh, motivated by their fan motives, right? Not any other motives to get access to content of uh, foreign uh, popular culture. One of the major barriers they faced was language. Right? How can they consume these content because the content was not really. Uh, imported to China through legal means, right? So they are not really prepared for the Chinese uh, audiences. So they uh, get them together, get themselves to get together, and try to translate the content so to facilitate to facilitate the consumption and enjoyment of these foreign foreign content. Through this process, right, fan communities actually build up uh, a quite impressive self organization skills and structure. With that uh, skills and structure and ability to act you also start to see conflicts, right? When the fan uh, groups uh, do not agree with each other. This kind of uh, uh, conflicts are most uh, seen uh, in uh, basically so-called fans of local uh, content and idols and fans of so-called for foreign uh, content and, and idols, right? Uh, here, I'll give you another example. Uh, it's a uh, 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 Baidu discussion uh, forum, right? Called Li Yi Ba. Uh, if uh, I guess many of you actually are familiar with uh, this uh, phenomenon or this event. Li Yi, ba, Li Yi is a, a local Chinese uh, soccer player, right? So the fandom developed around Li Yi is very unique because the fans uh, 
make fun of each other. They make fun of their idol as well, and they call each other Diao Si, right? So it's a very a distinct type of a fandom. However, the ability to act, the style uh, of their actions developed through this Li Yifa, later on transformed into something different. Basically, uh, what uh, has made into many of the international media's uh, headlines when they decided to uh, use all these uh, fan practices to express their nationalist uh, sentiments to uh, target the so-called other uh, communities that they do not agree with right, out of nationalist uh, motivations. So I'll stop there just to say that uh, all these uh, things we have seen today have their origins. And these origins uh, were actually uh, first motivated by fan uh, practices and fan intentions. All right, uh, now let me continue. So I noticed that after that, um, there was this uh, ear water uh, shedding <laughs> ear uh, that I, I, I think uh, that really uh, matters uh, for online fandom in China. Um, people probably would disagree with exactly when this happened, but I prefer uh, to agree with this view that in 2014, uh, we started to see the peak of local idol production. In 2014, there were two uh, very interesting developments, right? The first one is the introduction of Weibo ranking, right? So now you have a 24-7 engagement mechanism for the fans to feel that they are connected to their idols, they are doing something for their idols. The engagement is not completely just empty. There's a relationship ongoing, right? Uh, on the other hand, you also have a scene uh, the so-called sufficient supply of uh, local idols uh, shown in the return of uh, foreign trained idols back to the China, back to China, right? So these uh, four idols um, were trained in South Korea, right? They decided to come back to China and become, uh, you know, pursue their uh, the career in China. It shows that they have the high quality, as you can imagine. Uh, in a uh, worldwide uh, popular culture, right? So you have two things in, uh, converging here, a uh, local uh, supply of local idols, as well as, you know, ongoing and uh, uh, never stop uh, engagement as uh, fans can, uh, can, can get into, right? So with these two developments uh, going uh, at the same time, you start to see uh, basically fan organization, fan actions getting into a completely different level, right? Uh, so this uh, level is uh, also very widely uh, studied by many clicks here, right? Basically uh, uh, called uh, algorithmic or platformized uh, 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 online culture, fan culture, right? So at this stage, the key of uh, the focus is traffic. It's a concept of traffic, right? Traffic becomes uh, the uh, primary uh, concern or primary focus of the fan community as well. <clears throat> Sorry, here I uh, borrow a, a, a diagram right from uh, uh, Zhihu, right? So this diagram shows you what fan communities and fan uh, uh, fans themselves often uh, are engaged in in their daily activities. As, as you can see here, other than maybe the uh, traditional functions uh, such as uh, management of fans, finances, you know, uh, uh, supporting their idols offline, right? Majority of the of the work, right? Majority of the actions are actually uh, surrounded, uh, surrounding uh, the concept of making traffic or data worker, working for data, working for uh, all these uh, uh, traffic metrics uh, indicators that show that their idols uh, are doing great, right? So this uh, self-organization ability and the influence of this self-organization ability you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, have increased or have uh, leveled up to a completely different uh, stage. This stage can be problematic, you know, you can imagine uh, from both a governmental and a social perspective. So uh, that's why uh, last year, uh, two years ago, we started to see uh, this uh, crackdown uh, uh, action from uh, the government, right? So one of the uh, very popular online uh, idol show has asked their fans, buy milks, right? Buy milks uh, so they can get the tickets to support their idol. So this is a famous uh, milk dumping event. Uh, the uh, fans bought the milk, dumped the uh, milk. They only want the ticket hidden in the lid, right, of the milk bottle. So this has become uh, a, like a scandal, right, for the fan community and uh, attracted uh, uh, attention from the government for 
a strict control. That's why we had this Qinglang uh, movement, right? Qinglang crackdown uh, regulation immediately after uh, this incident. Well, there are many such incidents. I won't, wouldn't have time to talk to all of them, but just to show that, you know, that's how fan community have grown into a different stage of uh, high uh, capacity of making actions. Um, so I think I have given you a very brief, uh, very condensed version of the 30 years of online fandom in China. Uh, I also want to speak to some of the persistent academic interests I have observed, right? Uh, so the first one is definitely state society relationships. I ju just talking about statism. Statism has been really dominant uh, in all online uh, so-called uh, China internet research. Uh, you know, uh, fan uh, and fan studies are no uh, exceptions, right? So basically, this uh, perspective will look at how fans uh, get involved in uh, so-called state-led ideological work, such as nationalist movements. Other than that, we also have seen lots of uh, uh, research taking the labor perspective, right? To look at fans as uh, effective labor, as uh, data labor, who are exploited by maybe the culture industry and the capitals behind them. Uh, we also have seen other uh, so-called more positive or optimistic perspectives, such as participatory culture. My own book, uh, Fandom Publics, largely uh, has taken this perspective. And I also know, uh, our local uh, so-called China-based uh, scholars like Yang Ling has also looked at this perspective uh, as early as in the early to, uh, 21st century. Transcultural flow, uh, flow, another interest, basically to look at how uh, content maybe from Japan and Korea flow into China and enjoyed and accepted by the local audiences and vice versa. Right. Uh, last is identity politics. This is also a very interesting perspective. So how uh, 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 Professor Yun, Yun Ya Song just talked about gender disparity, the rise of uh, she economy, right? So here we also see how the female gaze, right, uh, at the male idols, right, uh, became an enjoyment that is backed up by females' uh, purchase powers in uh, economic, uh, in a capitalist economy. Right? So these are persistent interests, regardless why, which period we look at. Uh, in terms of our online China, uh, China's online fandom. Um, I also want to uh, maybe just uh, point out uh, some of the areas we need uh, uh, still more work right, in. Um, uh, Professor uh, Jian Shi just uh, now uh, gave a great example of uh, actually my first uh, call, the interpretation, uh, the integration of uh, so-called popular culture strategies and the governance, right? He talked about how Wang Hong thinking Right, became also something the government is pursuing. Uh, we have seen uh, similar uh, kind of examples uh, of a government using uh, fandom uh, or using fan practices, popular culture fan uh, styles to uh, do their, uh, uh, their their governance, right? To to engage their young audiences. That's the first call I want to make here. A second call here is. The economic aspect of fandom. So uh, two years ago, also I I, I wrote a Q and A column uh, in Hongbai, right, the China Shanghai based uh, online newspaper. So uh, in that, you know, uh, we talked about how economic aspect of fandom has gone through just you know asking fans to buy things, right. So the financialization of it, right. All this, these uh, data, uh, uh, all these traffic contribute to uh, not owning you know, uh, the income of their idols, but also a lot of uh, the unimaginable high profits behind the cultural industry, you know, owning these idols. Uh, the, the stock market, financial investment, uh, financial gambling are all part of fandom, right? So we need to study that as well. And I found this uh, aspect, right, the economic aspect, actually quite uh, prominent if you look at Chinese language or China-based fandom studies, right? Uh, my last uh, uh, third call is basically um, a refocus on transcultural fandom. Our first set of speaker right, mentioned something like disengagement. China and the world starts to disengage each other, seems, right? Uh, so uh, that's uh, another option we have, uh, observation we have here as well. So if uh, the local culture or local industry, culture industry, local idols become so prominent, then uh, Chinese audiences stop paying attention to 
uh, content from other parts of the world, then what does that mean? The lack of trans cultural fandom, what does it mean, right? As well as, you know, now we start to see China-based or China-made uh, cultural content starts to flow into other parts of the world, right? So the, the, the direction of the transcultural flow was uh, turned around, right? That's something we need to study as well. Okay, so uh, I will uh, finish my uh, talk uh, with just uh, two questions, right? Or two, uh, uh, again, two probably uh, uh, invitations uh, to our fellow academics uh, uh, to think about when we uh, pursue our China internet research in the future, right? So the first one is when we uh, evaluate all these uh, very exciting, interesting phenomena, right? And how uh, can we evaluate it? Um, if you look at the existing literatures on online fandom in China, the evaluation seems to be a little bit polarized, right? So if you take nationalism uh, and uh, the labor perspective, the evaluation is rather pessimistic, right? So people, fans, individual fans, uh, fan communities are exploited, right, for other political and economic uh, reasons, right? Uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, uh, participated culture, identity politics, seems to have a positive opt optimist uh, optimistic evaluation of fandom, right? Basically, fandom opens uh, opportunities, free uh, personal expressions, right? Give uh, agency, right, to the individual fans. How do we reconcile these uh, rather di uh, di very, very different, right, uh, uh, evaluations of fandom? My suggestion is probably we should be uh, even more fine-tuned uh, or fine-grained uh, when we look at uh, fandom. So fandom is not always good, not always bad. In certain situations, uh, for certain reasons, using certain kind of uh, criteria, it could be good or, or bad, right? So that's my first uh, question. The second question is uh, something that really uh, uh, dom dominates or occupies my mind uh, almost every day these, uh, these years. Basically, we have done uh, research on China internet for so many years. Uh, you know, other than this wonderful group of uh, fellow uh, researchers, what do we really contribute to knowing the world in general or knowing other parts of the world other than China, right? How can uh, knowing Chinese-ness, uh, right, knowing China contribute to global understanding of the same topic, right? So I attempt to give very initial answers to this question myself and I invite you to contribute more. First, we saw that in uh, online fandom in China, technology, capital, and government have very interesting dynamics. Any countries uh, who have fandom should look at this uh, so-called three-party uh, framework. Second one is uh, we can imagine, right? You know, with all the exp expansion of Chinese platforms, right? Uh, there might be a China wave coming to the shore very, very quickly. Now, uh, how uh, we we, we learned. Uh, from the local fandom in, in China may inform uh, the other parts of the world to get prepared for the arrival of the China wave. Lastly, uh, you know, we had a diverse implications when we talk about fandom in China. I'm sure that's the same, uh, that's a case, that's the same thing with uh, fandom in other parts of the world as well. Okay, I'm going to stop there. And uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. And I really uh, uh, look forward to the conversation later on. Thank you, Professor Wei Zhang of National University of Singapore. We are doing very well in terms of time, and we I think we have about half an hour um, for Q and A. I would like to invite our audience to submit your questions uh, through the QIA function. But first, I would like to invite our panelists uh, to ask questions of one another, if you have. And uh, um, our panelists, please, if you uh, have questions, please just unmute yourself, turn on your view, and speak directly. I believe Professor Pan has a question. Um... Uh, yes, um, I had a question for Professor Song, which is whether or to what extent do you observe age or age cohort differences? among women's use of the internet. I would imagine that teens use the internet very differently than women in their 30s or 40s. And so how yeah. great is that heterogeneity? And should we think about women as a whole or should we you know, separate women in, to some extent? Yeah, 
when we analyze. Yeah, we actually find there is um, there is a quite a few uh, differences in terms of uh, different age cohorts and as well as education levels. So according to the review of the previous findings, like uh, age cohorts, uh, perhaps between the mid age, the disparity is the lowest. But um, after that is all across all age holds, there is a very um, evident difference and as well as the educational levels. So these two variables are actually very uh, interesting variables affecting the gender disparity. Thank you. And across all ages, sorry, just to follow up, are, are, is it then the case that men and women are still different? Or is it the case in certain, certain age cohorts that there's greater similarity and that the comparison is kind of by age rather or education rather than by gender? Um, it's like uh, from the, for the people in the middle age, like the difference are relatively smaller. And however, aside, aside from that, um, the disparity is even more remarkable for the other age groups. And for education level, it's also very, but there, uh, for the education level, there are very mixed findings also depending on the rural areas and, and urban areas. And there's also a very evident uh, divide between the urban and rural areas. And also the situation is keeping changing because of the time limits. Um, I did not go into the details about the evolution of the gender disparity in terms of the user figures. And across the three decades, a lot of changes have happened in the 1980s and in the 1990s. And also we did a survey of figures in, after the 2000, and these figures keep changing. And uh, also we actually draw these figures, uh, we'll later draw very detailed figures in our essay. Great, thank you. So um, I see a few questions in the Q&A. The first one comes from Emma Wang. Um, I'll, and the question is, I'm gonna read the question. Um, I want to ask about Wang Hong phenomena. How do you think of young generations wishing to be Wang Hong other than, wish to be Wang Hong other than normal jobs? What influence do you see with this have on Chinese economy? Sounds like this is a question for Dr. Xu. Um, thank you, uh, Emma, for this great question. Um, I, I think this is not just a China uh, problem. Uh, I, I think it is a universal trend. Uh, as I read uh, a survey conducted in the US and the result is quite similar that many um, young people uh, they would like to become influencers rather than doing some other normal jobs. Um, I think for China, the trend might be caused by the, the, the worsening of the job market in recent years, especially since the pandemic. And it it is also because the, the university and the government at different levels, they encourage the, the students to uh, become entrepreneurs uh, using uh, digital media. So um, personally, I, I, I'm a bit pessimistic about the trend. As I said in my presentation, I think this kind of uh, Wang Hong thinking, uh, either the, the young people's Wang Hong thinking or the government's Wang Hong thinking to, to encourage them to become Wang Hong, uh, we promote short-termism and technological solutionism to solve the, the, the worsening um, unemployment issues. So uh, I think it will harm the, the economy rather than empower it in the long run. That's my, my thought. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xu. I see the next, uh, there are a couple of questions for Professor Yunya Song. Um, Professor Song, would you, th these are pretty long questions. I don't think I'm gonna read them. Would you like to take a look and see uh, whether yeah. you uh, how you might respond to them? Yeah, sure. So for uh, uh, for the first question is uh, elaborate on research linking China's online feminist movement and offline movement uh, voices, if there's any. Uh, so existing empirical evidence has indicated China's online feminist campaigns 
spurring offline actions. As I uh, mentioned in the presentation, for example, the Me Too movement, uh, despite censorship, um, this movement has gained traction online in China and offline speaking, it led to the public protests, university petitions, uh, as well as the legal actions against those perpetrators. Uh, I think these examples show the power of online movements and influence real world outcomes in China, as well as push for the social and legal reforms. However, um, there um, is also abundant research showing the challenges faced by this uh, online feminist movements in China. Uh, as we know, the censorship, the digital surveillance and nationalist um, backlash. And as for the following questions, um, uh, it's about the difference in internet usage and derived benefits between women and men, men and how to understand the reasons behind this phenomenon. Um, actually, for this question, I think it's a complicated one. To understand the reasons behind the differences in internet usage and the derived benefits between women and men, uh, need to consider historical, societal, and economic factors. Um, there, uh, it is a very um, complicated one. For example, for um, societal, um, society, historical context, we must look into the educational and economic opportunities uh, in terms of men, women. Um, uh, because for this question, it's not only about the access and usage, it is also about the ability for men and women to utilize the digital um, technology effectively. Is it a spiral? The digital, for me, according to uh, what I believe is the digital gender gap is not static. Uh, static. It can either widen or narrow. It actually depends on various factors. In China, for example, the policy interventions and the technological advancements aimed at inclusivity. And these factors uh, all play a very important role. And for um, another question um, of the same audience, um, let me see. Um, yeah, so the she economy, uh, women can get the power over men or become uh, empowered by engaging in consumer certain things. So the audience want to know, how do I think about the role of capitalism? Uh, women more autonomous in this process? Um, uh, I think uh, regarding the role of capitalism, I, I think uh, capitalism is kind of double-edged sword. And surely uh, what we know is the empowerment through this kind of consumption. And um, women actually can gain a kind of empowerment through consumption. Uh, it is rooted in our belief that this kind of purchasing power um, equates to personal or social empowerment. So participating in the economy as consumers, uh, which this female can express their identities, can make independent choices. Um, however, it, we also have to realize it operates within and reinforces kind of existing um, power structures. Um, it can both acknowledge women's autonomy, but at the same time, it perpetrates uh, the Chinese stereotypical notions of this kind of femininity and gender roles. Um, so capitalism does not necessarily or inherently challenge uh, gender inequalities. Um, it just adapts and exploits uh, this kind of dynamics for um, pro uh, profits. Um, so, but, um, but there is kind of economic independence and strategic consumption as we know, but there at the same time, there are the limitations and challenges. We have to realize women's choice um, are shaped and influenced by the external influences like the media representations and advertising and this kind of societal um, expectations. Um, and for the follow-up question, uh, the audience has a question regarding she economy and the shift from male gaze to female gaze I mentioned in the presentation. So, she uh, he wonders if I have any thoughts on what this male gaze or women's consumption in the digital space would affect the performance of creators, influence or marketers. Uh, this is a very interesting question. Mm. Uh, I think this kind of shift from male gaze to a female gaze in Chinese context um, actually um, brings a very significant transformation in content creation. Um, Take the uh, content, for example, 
as we can see that this kind of female gaze is more uh, reflective of women's desires and women's experiences and women's perspectives. So you can um, observe actually a kind of diversification of content. Actually, one of my PhD students is doing this kind of content analysis. So you can see there is a kind of diversification of content that uh, moves very uh, traditional Chinese stereotypes and representations to a more kind of nuanced and more authentic portrayals of women's lives. And actually, this kind of creators, marketers, they are very incentivized to produce this kind of content. Um, what resonates uh, this kind of transition of gaze. And you can see the changing narratives and, and aesthetics. And, and surely uh, there are economic implications behind that. Like uh, what we mentioned in the presentation, the monetization, and there are a huge amount of female followers. Um, yeah, and also the engagement dynamics in live streaming um, is also a very, very interesting. And as the audience just uh, mentioned in the question, so you can see the different vibes in live streaming rooms with predominantly male versus female audiences. And so it's very important uh, really to understand audience demographics in this kind of content strategy. And so, um, yeah, so that's what I'd like to uh, share. Thank you, Professor So Thank you. Uh, there are so many questions for you. Uh, so now I'm going to go uh, a little bit try to see because we have many questions and I, I we have a few more questions for Dr. Uh, Xu Jian and the questions for Dr. Uh, Wei, uh, Wei Yu Zhang. Uh, how about Wei Yu, can you take uh, take a couple of questions um, uh, first and then I'll turn to Xu Jian and then we have questions for Dr. Wang Wei. So uh, for the questions for uh, Professor Wei, uh, Wei Yi, I, I realize that our audience cannot see the questions, so either I read the questions or I ask our uh, speakers to read them uh, when you respond to them. I guess I'll read them. Um, uh, does that make sense? Uh, Wei Yi, you want me to read them out? You, you could read them to re read them out to when, for the questions for you. So I want to thank Professor Wei Yi Zhang for her talk on, this is from Becky Fan for her talk on Chinese fandom. I'm particularly interested in her su suggested future research direction on how popular culture from China has spread to other parts of the world. I'm working on the influence of popular culture from China on Vietnamese youth, potentially to compare it with the influence of Halui, the Korean wave. I'm curious if we you could kindly break down this research direction a little bit more to suggest uh, notable specific key research words in this direction. Thank you. And uh, before, why, uh, I'll read another question uh, for you, uh, just so that we can just uh, get all the questions together. Uh, this is from Ran Ju, also for Professor Wei Yu Zhang. First of all, thank you very much for this great presentation. My question is how the element of cultural politics of governance underneath the rise of Chinese fandom culture could be considered besides the nationalism, how to frame this. For example, as the campaign style political mobilization thrives during and after the pandemic, in my observation of the fandom community, I see some kinds of charismatic authority that take campaign style, campaign like mobilization as effective tool to sustain arbitrary power structure within the fan community. And also in terms of financialization of fandom, the financial relationships and economic activities among fans themselves are a bit un underexplored. Some phenomena of fans make a lot of money from the fan economy. How do you think that the framework of digital labor and platform capitalism could explain this? Thank you very much again. So yeah, will you take take uh, as uh, as you know uh, take the questions as you see appropriate? Uh, okay, thank you, thank you, Bobby. I, I, these are great great questions. Uh, you know, uh, let me try my best. Um, Becky, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, we, we, we have known uh, Becky. <laughs> we know each other for quite a while, right? So uh, I think you're doing something really, really interesting. Uh, this also is something I'm so much interested in as well. Uh, so basically the transcultural flow from China right, to other parts of the world. So you ask, you know, what might be the differences here? 
compared to uh, earlier uh, way, ways of uh, transcultural uh, uh, flow. So I, I noticed um, a few things, right? So first, uh, you know, let's think about what has happened with uh, Han Liu, right? Han Liu uh, was basically, uh, according to some uh, 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 scholars, right? It was uh, very much a state-led, right? So the state of uh, the South Korean government uh, played a big part behind, you know, pushing uh, South Korean popular cu uh, culture content to the other part of the world out of what motivation, economic motivations, right? So uh, all these uh, uh, South Korean technology companies, right, they want to sell uh, their, their phones, right? They want to sell their products to the other parts of the world. And then uh, South Korean Hanlyu idols are perfect, so-called spokesperson, right, for these uh, products. Uh, so we could borrow from this uh, observation and think about the expansion, the, the ultimate drive behind the expansion of China pop to the other parts of the world. I would say it would still be pop, probably economically driven and also uh, politically so-called influenced, right? Uh, however, uh, China is in a very different uh, position compared to South Korea. China's uh, international relationships are a lot more uh, so-called hostile in a sense, right, uh, than South Korea. So uh, this would actually put China in a very tricky position if they want to, uh, you know, uh, all the Chinese uh, public culture content, if they want to really push the content very aggressively with very distinct Chinese uh, characteristics, they might not work, right, as uh, South Korean content. So uh, they need to think about other uh, strategies, so-called to localize the content, to make their content acceptable. So I would uh, su uh, suggest or, or encourage, you know, all of us to think along that way, right? So how China's uh, unique position in the world would actually influence the kind of strategies and also resistance. We have seen so many resistance, right? Resistance uh, seen uh, from the local uh, or the other parts of the world uh, when it comes to China, right? So that's my uh, first answer to the, the second uh, question. I think also uh, touched upon two very different questions. Let me try to uh, remember. Uh, so uh, the first one was about um, uh, nationalism, right? Um, yeah, I, I, first of all, I want to just quickly uh, address this. I, I agree that governance is not just about nationalism. Right? Governance is not just about, uh, you know, pushing uh, Chinese young people or fans to be nationalist or outspoken uh, on the internet, right? It's also uh, about governance itself, right? Uh, how do we actually uh, go govern a so super diverse population, right? And maintain popularity, and political legitimacy, right? The Chinese government needs to do this. So they can learn a lot from the popular culture uh, strategies, how idols become popular, right? This can be learned, right? And then how um, political authority also stay popular uh, among uh, the people they govern, right? So that's my quick answer. Uh, second answer, a uh, second question about uh, the, the, yeah, the hierarchy or economic, uh, uh, so called structure within fan community. I totally agree with you. That's why I, I, I felt the self organization of fan community have gone into a completely different level because it's now a highly organized, a very complicated hierarchy now, right? So the, we know uh, all these uh, so called uh, leader fans, right? Fento, right? Uh, sometimes they make a huge amount of profits out of maintaining uh, this community, right? Uh, in the name of uh, supporting their idols. So the, I actually agree with you that this is a relatively unexamined and a very interesting uh, uh, research area. It's so more like a, a organizational communication <laughs> in a popular culture uh, uh, setting, right? So uh, if you have time and resources, I would really encourage you to 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 further uh, pursue this line of research, right? And see how this uh, so-called uh, fan economy works, both internally and externally. Right, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang. So we have two questions for Dr. Xu Jian. One is from Xenia Wang. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Xu. In what way are Wang Hong thinking and internet thinking different? Uh, another question for Dr. Xu, uh, Xu from Cal Calvin Hui. Uh, thank you for your talk about Wang Hong. Can you discuss the relationship between Wang Hong role models and socialist role models? In what ways are the contemporary Wang Hong, such as Li Ziqi, 
um, or the wolf warrior diplomat and CCTV anchorman? Uh, in what way are they socialist and revolutionary role models? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yang Lao Shi, and thank you for uh, the two very interesting questions. Um, for the first question, um, as I said in the presentation, I, I take Wang Hong thinking as an illusion of internet thinking. Um, I think Wang Hong thinking represents the latest stage of internet thinking. So if we take like the e-government uh, websites as the first step of uh, internet thinking, uh, we, we can see that this official websites uh, uh, it's mainly for the dissemination of um, official information to the public. But if we look at Wang Hong thinking, we can see that uh, self-branding strategies uh, have been used to implement this kind of thinking. And also platform logics, uh, especially uh, algorithm, uh, have, have been considered to uh, implement this kind of uh, uh, Wang Hong thinking. So I think uh, Wang Hong thinking represents the latest stage of uh, internet thinking. Um, for the second question um, about uh, the differences between Wang Hong role model and socialist role model, um, I, I think they are similar, but also different. For uh, Wang Hong role models, I, I think they, uh, they, they target uh, at the young people rather than the whole population as socialist role model. For example, Li Ziqi was set up as a role model because if you um, read the official media's coverage on Li Ziqi, uh, you can see that she has been uh, set up as a role model called excellent uh, youth, uh, promoting rural economy to inspire you know, the, the, the young, um, digital media entrepreneurs to, to follow her step to help uh, uh, promote local rural economy and also to promote traditional Chinese cultures to overseas audience. Um, I think the target audience mainly focuses on young people for Li Ziti's case rather than the whole population uh, like the socialist role model. And I, I think another difference is the is a covering a coverage of the mainstream media on these role models, um, we, we can't see that much news media coverage on Li Ziti as uh, the media coverage and representations of socialist role models. I think this might be caused by the changing you know, media practice of mainstream media and also the, uh, the perception of the, the public's on role models. So it, sometimes if you report too much uh, on a specific role model, the media effect might be not good. Uh, it may cause backlash sometimes. So that's my um, response to the second question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xu. Uh, next question for Dr. Wang Wei uh, from Nora Cho. Um, your theorization of locality appears to hold significant potential for future research. However, I'm also curious about your perspective on its limitations as a concept. In other words, in what contexts do you believe that the concept may not be adequate and will require the support of other concepts? Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Yan. Thank you, Dora. Thank you so much for the question. It's a great question. It also it helps us to refine our thinking on locality. Um, so actually, the focus on locality is rooted in academic discussions around spatial differences in social theory back in the 1980s and around locality in human geography back in the 98, uh, 1980s as well. So to take human geography as an example, in the mid to late 1980s, a group of critical geography scholars devoted themselves to problematizing problematizing locality research, a bit for different purposes. So on the one hand, the withdrawal from radical action made some scholars to engage more in community participation at the local level. Uh, on the other hand, the efforts to dismantle an overly orthodox or even totalizing theory sought local practices and particularities. 
Wild interest in locality research was a forceful intellect, intellectual threat um, uh, like uh, regarding the pursuit of radical political agenda. The value of locality like research has actually um, solidified itself as a critical field of analysis. And in our research, we use this concept of locality and draw on the history of internet-based local media to try to refresh the connotations of locality. We want to investigate the social implications of the internet um, for the local society. And we take this formative approach and try to analyze analyze the social processes of reinvention of locality from the spatial, economic, and political aspects. And actually, it comes to your question about limitations. We also think the concept, it, it's not totalizing. It's actually, um, it's its very, um, its uh, it can explain some phenomenon, but of course, like any concept cannot do it for all. So we think it might be limited in articulating the multiple dimensions of the relationship between people and the place, the relationships among different actors at the local level, the spatial organizing of local society, and also it might be limited in abstracting the different forms of local organizing. And also here it goes back to your question as well in terms of how we can use the support of other concepts to help with us to investigate the social processes um, underpinning locality and like other concepts that can be used to describe the local transformations. And here we also borrow our concepts from the other disciplines such as place, space, sense of place, community, like everyday life, from geography, sociology, to actually to do it together to, to, um, to help further our research agenda in terms of how the local society has been transforming, as we said, like in the past, in the present, and in the future, especially like given uh, we can have a historical perspective, we can actually delve further back into the history. Like we know something about local TV stations at the county level, but actually we don't know that much about the whole media landscape at the local county level. So I feel that there's much that we can do in terms of using like the the, the power of this set of concepts, including place, sense of place, space, community, everyday life, and locality. Thank you so much. I hope this helps and thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, our next question from Xi Ning Liao. I be, believe this is for Professor uh, Jennifer Pan and Matt. Uh, uh, Thank you for the info, for the insightful presentations. I was wondering, compared with prior understanding of the dynamics between Chinese internet users in the state, whether you identified any unique or new patterns phenomena in these dynamics during the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um so I think one pattern that if we, so not speaking of the internet, but of social media, uh, if we look at, for example, Weibo data from 2009 to 2022, what we see is a continual decline in what I might call everyday political talk. So this is not talking about high politics, but talking about what's happening in society, uh, commenting on social, political, economic issues that has steadily declined and continues to decline. And what's contributing to that decline are two things. One is that people who used to talk about these things, the everyday political talk, are no longer doing so. And then new users who have joined are not using social media to talk about these issues. If we look at the recent years, uh, something like 50%, if we and, and we look at, let's just take one platform, Weibo, uh, large-scale data from the platform, more than half of all content and discussions is related to fandom. Uh, and, and a lot of that fandom discussion, what we found is not necessarily substantive. It's, um, uh, so, so there's this, well, I think one trend that we see is this, is this steady decline over the past decades in political content. But during COVID, I think there is an uptick because everyday life is so 
strongly affected by government policies. Um, I think another trend or another change, and this is not unique to China per se and not unique to COVID, is just a change in the technologies and platforms that are being used. So we're not in social networks anymore. A platform like Douyin is so algorithmically driven that the dynamics between user and any content creator, whether it's the state or otherwise, is fundamentally different. And I think because of that, a lot of the assumptions that we've had about state um, public interactions need to be reexamined because there is this personalized recommendation uh, that is intervening. Although I think there's increasing evidence that that the state can also affect the algorithmic recommendations, but there is still this different intervening force that is in kind different than the social networks um, that we think of in um, uh, in the 2000s and 2010s. Thank you, Professor Pan. Um, we are sort of uh, running out of time, and we are scheduled to end at. Uh, quarter, uh, I mean, 15 past uh, 10. So I'm going to, we still have uh, quite a few questions. I, I'm going to give uh, Professor Zhang uh, there are a few questions. Uh, she can respond to a couple of them. And, uh, and then uh, I, I'm, I'm going to give our uh, all our speakers a chance uh, to, um, to just, uh, you know, wrap up with uh, any final comments or thoughts you have you don't have to but if you have uh, that's your final chance and um and then we'll wrap today wrap up today but uh, we'll still have time tomorrow tomorrow morning eastern time and uh, tomorrow evening beijing time so uh, i'll do, now turn this over to professor wei yu zhang would you like to read your question uh, yes, uh, because uh, I'm actually trying to type my uh, answers uh, to one of the questions. Maybe I'll just read it out. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, Yu Qi Yang, right, uh, asked this question about uh, how shall we uh, compare uh, Chinese and U.S. Um, fandoms, right? You know, I, I totally agree, actually. Um, in, in, one, in my uh, 2016 book, uh, Fandom Publics, I actually analyzed how Chinese audiences are uh, uh, enjoyed uh, the uh, Netflix uh, US show uh, House of Cuts. Right? It's all about American uh, politics. How do they derive joy right, from uh, watching this uh, kind of uh, shows? Uh, and I, I think um, with uh, Netflix and other platforms, the so-called Western audiences can now also access uh, China-made uh, content. Right? Uh, for, for instance, the popular show um, the the boys love <laughs> the some kind of a homo uh, uh, sexual content show that was uh, popular in China and banned later uh, actually can be found on Netflix as well. Right? So I think uh, especially in view of this uh, very entangled international relationship, right, political discourses, it will be even more interesting to examine how American audiences uh, consume China uh, make content and vice versa, right? So, you know, which kind of uh, enjoyment, right? How, what are the motivations behind, you know, uh, consuming content of your rivalries <laughs> or your, of your enemies, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, content, right? So that's that's uh, my question, uh, answer to that particular question I'm uh, answering, right? Yu uh, Mi, Yu Mi Tian, right? So, I've done some observations on the fandom of Chinese celebrity who is blocked by Chinese government. They show their expectations on some commercial institutions, which may help their idol to come back to China and show loyalty to political power. Meanwhile, they pay a lot of money and attention on the idol's business uh, to support his estate. Things you refer, you refer related financial topic about this, how do you analyze or understand this phenomenon? So, Yumi, I... I Roughly know who you are talking about. Uh, uh, I saw his uh, advertisement in Singapore. Uh, although he's uh, completely banned uh, in China, I, I saw his album uh, released. Uh, his fan paid uh, to buy uh, advertisements in Singapore's major uh, 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 subway right subway stations to support him. Right. Um, so uh, what can I say about him? Right. You know, I, I can only say that. Uh, he the ban of uh he he 
I felt, right, although I have no hard evidences, uh, is definitely financially driven as well, right? Politically, both politically and financially driven, right? Uh, nowadays, uh, many of the uh, political so-called uh, discourses and even actions have been used by financial power, right, to compete against each other, right? So um, that that's, I think, so much I can say here. You could probably uh, search online you know, to find more analysis on this, but I think his ban is not just uh, purely driven by uh, by political reasons. There are uh, financial reasons behind that as well, right? Um, yeah, I think that's that's all, right? Thank you, Thank you uh, Professor uh, Zhang. I think uh, we are out of time and we won't be able to take all the questions. I apologize. Um, but we'll take note of all the questions and uh, our uh, and our panelists can, this will be very helpful for our panelists to, uh, you know, to uh, work on their papers, which will come out um, in the journal Communication and the Public, uh, as I mentioned early on, edited by Professor Hong Yu at Zhejiang University and Professor Christine Huang at Su City University of Hong Kong. But before we close, I'd like to see whether our panelists have any final remarks to share, final thoughts to share. And you can just, uh, you know, turn on your video and turn on your uh, audio and uh, anything, anyone? Um, I'll just say thank you so much to Professor Yang for convening. Um, and giving us this opportunity to really reflect and take a step back and think about the internet more broadly and where it's come and where it might be going. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you all uh, our panelists. I think this is amazing. Um, it's an amazing way of uh, marking the 30th anniversary in 1994. So certainly we couldn't do something like this. And now today we are connected despite all the challenges we still face. Um, and this is also a wonderful occasion for us to really just, uh, you know, hear one another and, uh, of course, also learn about uh, your uh, cutting edge new research, very exciting new ideas. And so I hope uh, you can, um, those in the audience, I also want to thank you very much for asking great questions uh, to our panelists and for joining us uh, tonight, I mean, in the morning in Asia. Uh, in the evening uh, on the east coast of the United States. And I hope you'll be able to join us again tomorrow morning, uh, Eastern time, and uh, tomorrow evening, Beijing time, Beijing time, 9 o'clock, and uh, Eastern time, 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, with that, I thank you again. And uh, we are uh, we are done today. We are, you know, uh, we finished uh, all our discussions. And I hope you have a good night. Great day, and I'll see you tomorrow.